So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, second invited talk. Uh, professor uh, Russell Impaiazio is a professor of computer science here at uh, UCSD. At a TCC, where we, we, where we are celebrating the complexity-based approach to cryptography, there are few people as appropriate as Russell to address the conference. Russell has uh, deep fundamental works in both fields of complexity and cryptography. And his most foundational works, just to mention a few examples, include Hill, which is a pseudo-random generator from any one-way function, impossibility of obfuscation, which you've heard a lot about at this conference. One-way functions are necessary for cryptography, something we take it, uh, for granted today, but really beginning the study of necessary and not just sufficient assumptions for cryptography. Black box separations, which you've also heard a lot about uh, uh, today, and much more. And anybody looking, uh, uh, we all know actually that Russell's work is a uh, really unique combination of both technical depth and far-reaching conceptual contributions. So just to go a little bit more detail, his work on black box separations have been extraordinarily influential and it's really hard to imagine the uh, uh, modern assumptions landscape without this fundamental tool. We have a much deeper understanding today of what assumptions are necessary and whether or not they're implied by others, of course, under, under black box reductions. Russell today will talk about general versus specific assumptions in cryptography, a topic which actually has become recently a topic of, of some controversy. I'm personally very interested in uh, hearing Russell's perspective on the issue, and please join me in inviting Russell to give the second keynote address at TCC. Well, uh, first I want to thank Yehuda and all the other organizers for inviting me, and thank Shafi for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, hopefully, um, today's talk will have no technical depth, but will have some controversy, if I can at all achieve it. Okay. So, um, okay. Well, so, um, you know, cryptography has been around in some form, you know, as an informal discipline for thousands of years. But, if you look at what cryptography is today versus what it was in uh, 1974, you can just see that the growth is phenomenal. And a lot of the reason for this growth is um, the introduction of complexity theoretic foundations for cryptography, where we have formal models for understanding the power of both algorithms and adversaries. Um, so let me give you very brief history of what this growth looks like. Okay. So what happens repeatedly is someone comes up with a totally new thing that we can achieve using cryptography. Okay. So that's kind of the seminal paper that gets an area start, a subfield started. And of course, and then you have the follow-up work. You know, people get efficiency savings. And you have the work that extends the model and does something even more powerful. And then you have my paper. <laughs> so, um, so what I, what I want to do is try to um, see where this, this uh, project of finding the minimal assumptions, um, how that project fits into our overall scheme of doing more powerful cryptography, more efficient cryptography, and more robust cryptography. Okay. Um, so what I am going to do in this talk, what I'm not going to do in this talk is really say anything of any technical formal depth. Okay? Uh, what I am going to do is sort of tell some stories, muse a little bit, um, pose some open questions, but in a way that cannot be formalizable in any way, shape, or form, or at least I haven't. And, um, but there will be some practical applications to the talk. I hope the practical, main practical application will be mainly, like maybe you could take a phrase or two and use it in a grant application, which I think is sort of the application we care most about. <laughs> OK. So, um, so the first reason, of course, to like study what the minimal um, assumptions are 
uh, is because some of our assumptions just might not be true. Okay? So we made a lot of hardness assumptions. And you can think of, like, as we go up the, the tree, you know, there's sort of the low-hanging fruit of cryptography, like, like private key cryptography, um, signature schemes, one, you know, commitment schemes, zero knowledge. And then you go up the tree, and you see more esoteric branches. And these more esoteric branches, like um, identity-based encryption or uh, secure program obfuscation are based on more tenuous assumptions. So as we go up the tree, we get more powerful, um, tastier fruit, but at the risk of going out on a limb as far as the assumptions we're making. And, um, you know, so it's tempting to take, well, the point of view that, um, that assumptions are, are relatively harmless. Because, uh, well, here, here's sort of the controversial point. You say, you could take two points of view about what hardness assumptions make. Okay. And the point, that, uh, the point of view that some people take that I don't encourage is to view uh, an assumption as just a statement about the state of the art. No one currently has an algorithm to solve this problem and therefore the, a protocol based on uh, the adversary not being able to solve the problem is secure. Okay. I don't think that's a good way of looking at things. Um, okay. Because um, uh, there's, a, there's a few th reasons not to, is that what this really means is that no one has actually written up an algorithm and published a paper that says that their algorithm solves the problem. It doesn't actually say that no one actually has an algorithm solving the problem. And so if you go to a different community, we tend to believe, you know, you know, or take for granted that when there isn't an algorithm known to solve a problem, that that means instances of the problem are typically hard. But if you go to other communities, like people doing um, SAT solving, they tend to believe the exact opposite of what we believe, which is that unless there's a bloody good reason why a problem is hard, it's probably easy on typical instances. Um, and there aren't that many reasons you can give them why uh, search problems are hard. So um, now the truth is somewhere in between, but it's certainly not the case that every assumption that we've made historically has proved to be a hard problem, or even that um, it required a huge advance in algorithms to, to crack um, even widely believed secure crypto systems. Sometimes some tweak to a known algorithm, or just people have the idea of applying a known algorithm technique like lattice reduction to a problem that doesn't seem to involve lattice reduction, and suddenly um, a crypto system that seemed really secure, gets broken. So, um, so I think we do have to like evaluate which assumptions we're going to believe, or you know, which are more plausible. And you know, for specific assumptions, we have these kind of heuristics for, um, for giving assumptions more credibility, hardness assumptions more credibility. One is, the kind of test of time heuristic, okay? which is that if a problem has been out there in the mathematical literature as something basic to be studied for a long time, and mathematicians, you know, serious mathematicians have studied this problem, and then probably the best algorithms we know are close to the best algorithms that exist. This heuristic also has some problems. Because you say, like, so a problem like factoring has been studied since the dawn of mathematics, okay? probably before the, you know, any kind of written mathematics that survived to this day. Um, people have been interested in factoring numbers. But if you look at progress in factoring, it sort of mirrors progress in cryptography. 
except maybe some things implicit in Gauss's private notebooks, there was essentially no progress on faster factoring algorithms until the 70s. Okay. And then RSA was published, and suddenly um, people started having new ideas for factoring algorithms. And so the best factoring algorithms today are of different, um, different types and you know, are a quantum leap more sophisticated and, uh, and a quantum leap more faster, you know, even asymptotically, than the, the algorithms that were known even in um, the late 70s, even in the 80s. Okay. So, um, so why is this a good heuristic at all? So I think Moni Noor gave me the most convincing reason to use this heuristic. He told me that, well, the reason why I want to use, base my crypto on a, um, a very well-studied mathematical problem is that if it gets broken, it's probably by, you know, a Lenstra <laughs> and not by some anonymous hacker. <laughs> and, you know, Lenstra is not going to just go and steal all my bitcoins. He's going to um, actually publish a paper and let me know my system is broken. So that is, I think that is a big advantage, but it's not one, you know, we want to talk about too loudly or something. <laughs> okay. So if we, if, but I, I don't know if any other, you know, besides saying how much attention has been put into it and how little progress has been made, how else do we, and, you know, when we could try to relate assumptions to other assumptions, but there aren't so many very distinct you know, even like discrete log and factoring that are really seem to be deeply connected in terms of algorithmic um, approaches. There's no direct reduction from one to the other. So, um, so I don't know of any other heuristic that we can make for for plausibility of um, specific assumption. But um, but I have another kind of argument that I can apply to plausibility of general assumptions, which is that a, a general assumption, okay, so one, one you know, I guess one definitive thing you can say about a general assumption is if you can prove that it's equivalent to your cryptographic solution, then you say, okay, well, this is my assumption, and I don't have any choice. If, if it's not true, we're out of luck. If there are no one-way functions, we all go home or use quantum or something. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so, uh, so there's that argument, okay, which still isn't really a reason to believe that something's true. It's just a reason to, to, to sort of assume it temporarily. Okay. Um, the other thing, though, we can look at is once we have a general assumption, we can look for, you know, a general assumption is a family of specific assumptions. You can say, well, if we've got many distinct ways that seem unrelated of um, instantiating the same kind of primitive, then, you know, chances are one of these ways is secure. Not totally true, you know, because things like, as I said, discrete log and and factoring, even though they don't seem to be related as far as the reduction from one to the other, it just turns out that every advance in factoring algorithms has a related, you know, analogous discrete log algorithm. And so these independence is a between between assumptions breaking is kind of a false um, false idea too. Okay. But um, well what's the best we can do? But then the other thing that you can um, that you can do with a general assumption that you can't do um, with a particular assumption to sort of heuristically evaluate its plausibility is to tell it as a story. Okay. And you say, is it actually plausible that some version of the story could be true? Okay. So, um, okay. so like a, a one-way function, you can say, can I invent 
hard solve puzzles. Puzzles where I know the solution, but it's hard for someone else. And that's equivalent to a one-way function. And actually, it would seem like more, more counterintuitive if, you, if any way of generating hard solve problems uh, was breakable. Then it would be that if there's some way of generating hard solve problems, to me. Okay, well, often, that's how we generate hard problems. We come up with a solution. You know, isn't this how you generate homework problems? <laughs> you need to be able to publish. You need to tell the students how it works. So you come up with a solution first, and then you come up with a problem that meets your solution. I'm afraid some people even write papers this way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, you know, but uh, so it would be kind of implausible that that there's there's some way. Uh, there's, there's no way of doing this. Okay. Or public key encryption it has a more convoluted story. You can say, like, can you tell me how to generate a problem that you can solve? And I'll, be able to, I'll, be, I'll also be able to solve it because I generated it. So that's also like people, oh, well, people have their own domains of expertise. Yeah, you could probably do that. So that's kind of a plausible story. Okay. So it seemed like likely that we maybe likely that we could do it but th the thing we can do with these stories is we can negate the stories what would the world look like if that story were really impossible okay. and you know if we can get a counterintuitive conclusion from the negation of a story then i think it's really strong evidence that the assumption is not only plausible, but is very likely to be true. Okay. And, um, and the kind of thing, you know, since we're talking about hardness assumptions usually, the kind of thing that the negation of the story tells is there's some kind of generic algorithm to solve a, kind of a particular kind of problem. So the, the strongest version I know is with uh, one-way functions. And obviously, it's going to be stronger than anything else because it's the weakest assumption. So the negation is the strongest. Um, but if one-way functions don't exist, there are actually lots of things that we can do algorithmically, like compressed distributions to the, the information theoretic uh, limits for data compression, no, no matter what the distribution is, as long as we know how to sample from it. Or um, uh, we know how to do um, kind of very strong, generic, average case learning in this. In, under this assumption, okay, where you know, without knowing what a function is, we can actually figure out what it is from very small amounts of data. Now, again, you know, cryptographic community say, "Oh, well, that's kind of an implausible free lunch story." Go to a learning conference and say, "Well, that's what we do all the time." <laughs> you know, so um, so what's counterintuitive for one person may be just completely matter of fact for another. So, you know, this isn't a proof, but I think it's some kind of evidence that the world would look very strange, a little different, if the, the assumption weren't true. Okay. Um, so, one, one, the first, I said uh, there's going to be some ill-posed questions from time to time. So, the first kind of ill-posed question I want to ask is, can we come up with a reason, a similar reason, why other of our assumptions are plausible. So if we negate, so you know, usually we want to say, assuming this kind of cryptographic tool exists, we can do amazing things. Why don't you start thinking, what happens if cryptographic primitives don't exist? How would that impact the world? So um, say that secret key agreement, for example, isn't possible. Would that have any kind of broad algorithmic consequences. And a couple, you know, just sort of like thinking about it off the top of my head, saying like, could we, you know, sort of like what secret key agreement says is that we can have a conversation where we agree on some information in common. Okay. So sort of the strong negation of that would be to say, you eavesdrop on a conversation, generically, I can figure out all the information that you two have in common. And everything else, you're, you're, you're talking, but you're not communicating. OK? 
Okay, so there's this public part that you've just announced to the whole world. There are the private parts that you've maybe hinted at but not really communicated to your, you know, happens a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you know, the snide comment that you know what you meet, but you're not really expecting anyone else to know. Okay, so there's that part of the conversation, and then there's the communication that occurred. Can we have some algorithmic way to figure out which is which, assuming the secret key agreement is impossible? And uh, maybe we could use that for, in the distributed setting, to have kind of a win-win situation okay. uh, for, for protocols like consensus, okay, where you're trying to, like, everybody reach an agreement about what, what's happening. You say, like, well, there are two things, um, two kinds of information. You know, if secret key agreement is possible, then we can communicate privately and reach consensus that way, despite an adversary. If secret key agreement isn't possible, then whatever two people in our group knows, everybody knows. So it's like a perfect gossip network. And so we've reached consensus that way. Okay, so this is very, very hand wavy, but I'm just trying to like think how we could get some kind of consequences that would be good from the negation of, of um, cryptographic assumptions. So another one, and actually this is something that, that Stefan Savage asked me a long time ago um, when he heard about this work on obfuscation and possibility. He said, can we actually use the fact that obfuscation is impossible? Okay. And uh, when I think about it, okay, probably not for that paper, but now we have like stronger or weaker notions of obfuscation, so their negations would be stronger. So could we say that if we can't obfuscate in certain ways. That means we can understand programs. Well, understanding programs would be really nice. So can we say that we understand programs, you know, so like not being able to obfuscate says, well, we can understand programs in, in some kind of existen weak existential way. There's something about programs we can understand. Could we actually massage that to say there's something interesting about programs that we could understand? Um, so, you know, maybe if we could do that, we could say from the negation of obfuscation, hmm, okay, um, okay, that's, that's the problem is that this, uh, the, the words on this slide are out of order. The ones on top are actually meant to be on the bottom. So, um, so what could we do? Think about you know what would be useful to to, to understand about a program. Um, it would be useful to understand if the program's malicious in some way. It would be in, you, useful to understand whether it ever outputs one because that's the circuit has viability problem. So and if you could actually solve even in any kind of non-trivial way um, the circuit has viability problem. You know if you solve it in polynomial time p equals n p story is over. Uh, but if you could solve it even in slightly sub-exponential time, Ryan Williams knows how to use that to prove a lower bound. So could, could we actually show that if obfuscators don't exist, we get a circuit lower bound? That would be um, a nice connection. You know, and maybe that would be a reason to believe that obfuscators exist because that would be too nice. Okay. So, um, so okay. So, so one thing that looking at these kind of generic assumptions, classes of, of types of, of objects rather than specific objects give us is more heuristics for deciding plausibility. I want to move on to another, another criteria, you know, another sense in which they're useful, which I think is evaluating specific um, assumptions. Okay. So as I said before, you know, our main heuristic for um, deciding on the plausibility of specific hardness assumptions is whether there's been cryptoanalytic crypto effort devoted to these problems has failed. Well, there's only so much cryptoanalytic effort to go around. Okay? So the more assumptions we put in the pile, the less there is for each one of them. Okay? So we have to be a little bit careful about when we add a new assumption. 
So I want to say that we can look at things in terms of the implications between the generic assumptions will give us insight into when it's worthwhile to add a new cryptographic function to our, our set that we're going to devote some effort to evaluating. And, and that's if you know we have these kind of hierarchy of stronger cryptographic primitives that we could hope for, and we have black box separations between them. And what that means is that the one sort of low down in the totem pole, yawn, who cares? Who wants another one-way function? You know, one-way functions are a dime a dozen. Anything is really a one-way function. Okay? So you tell me a new one-way function, I don't care. I'm not even going to think about trying to break it, unless you're Odette Kultrike. Okay? So, um, but if you, give, if, you, if you give me a new signature scheme, hey, uh, you know, 30 years ago, I might have been excited by that. You know, that's, that's public key cryptography, not private key. Okay. But um, now that we have the Yor, Yang, and Rampel, we say, oh, well, that's actually equivalent to this one-way function. Any one-way function gives us a signature scheme, so you didn't actually do anything more than, than uh, the other guy who gave me this one-way function. But if you give me a way of doing secret agreement that's new, that's really interesting because secret agreement is, is much harder than a one-way function. Okay. And if you give me homomorphic encryption, you know, a new way of doing homomorphic encryption, you know, we have a couple of ways, but really that's kind of fra in a fragile state, a new assumption that would allow us to do something high powered like that, that's really interesting. Okay, so another, another reason why we want to look at both specific assumptions and generic assumptions is to give us some kind of vision that's going to allow us to, to imagine more uses of cryptography. Okay. Saying like, so the difference, be, so I'm saying like in this slide, saying the difference between looking at specific assumptions and generic assumptions, like appreciating detailed realistic art and abstract minimalism. Okay. You know, in detailed art tells a really rich story. You know, I guess there's like this Charlie Brown cartoon where Linus um, asks Lucy to tell him a story, and she is bored, doesn't want to do this. So finally she says, there once was a man, he lived, he died. And Linus says, gee, it really makes you wish you'd known him. <laughs> You know, so, um, so, you know, um, so the, the sort of minimalistic assumptions allow us to uh, appreciate the universal, whereas um, looking at specific cryptographic functions allows us to sort of get a much more detailed image of what's going on. So, and, you know, this kind of imagining what could be, of course, plays a big role in how we, how we innovate. Okay. So, um, you know, so like, I think it's really important that, you know, crypto students be exposed to both things like um, the R, you know, details of how RSA, discrete log work, and sort of abstract definitions of what a hard function is because, um, because um, things like RSA have a lot of coincidental structure that doesn't have to do with their hardness, but somehow both, ha both ha suggest opportunities and looks l also um, create vulnerabilities. So RSA for, you know, a lot of these functions, for example, have some kind of random self-reducibility where you can take one problem, one instance of a problem, and map it to a random instance of the problem. So if you later learn the instance to that random instance, you know the answer to the, to the first one. So that's really a possibility. You use that a lot in things like blind signatures, okay, where you want to be able to, you know, to randomize something. But it also is a problem 
for issues like malleability, where you want to say the person knows what they're asking you to assign, or the, you know, the person who's giving you something, committing to something, knows what they're committing to. And uh, with these functions, um, that's really just not the case. So having specific examples gives you, you know, models to work with. It may not be true in the generic case, but give you insight into what could be true, both in terms of possibilities and vulnerabilities. Um, but I want to say that actually thinking about these kind of generic assumptions gives us a different kind of insight. Um, so the kind of insight that we get by, by trying to do things in a minimal way is that sometimes the details of how we, uh, of specific functions, overwhelm, um, you know, so we come up, as I said, often we come up with the solution and then define the problem based on our solution. And the danger with that, um, you know, isn't lack of technical depth, isn't that it makes it too easy, is that then we define the problems too narrowly to fit the solution. Okay. So properties of the solution, like, oh, the RSA function is a permutation for every fixed key, become part of the definition of what a public key encryption system is, at least until like the late 90s when lattice-based encryption comes along and you have to throw that part out. And you say, okay, we threw that part out, what did we lose? Absolutely nothing, because that part really wasn't required in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So we shouldn't have defined it that way to begin with. Okay. Um, so by thinking about the minimal assumptions, we help to distinguish the problems, the tests we're trying to solve from the solutions. Okay. Um, and by doing so, we allow ourselves to consider a richer class of possible solutions. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that I said that you know, looking at the special cases, special functions, allows us to, to, to imagine different kinds of coincidences that could happen. Thinking of the generic case allows us to imagine what happens if there's no coincidences. Um, I guess the other, the other reason why we should look, you know, that we, well, that's good training to think about generic assumptions is that if you just look at specific assumptions, they're always talking about hardness, algorithmic hardness. But what we know is that actually when new algorithms come along, you know, like file pairings or something, they create opportunities as well as, as challenges. You know, they're not, it's not, new algorithms aren't always bad news because really we have two sides to, to strong cryptography. One is for the legitimate users, we need strong algorithms to compute functions, whereas for the attackers, we're hoping that strong algorithms don't exist. Once you've got it to the to the level where you're, you're making a specific hardness assumption, you miss that first part entirely. But if you're talking about do trapdoor permutations exist or do, um, secret, does secret agreement agreement exist, you're, th you're also thinking about the first part, how would we come up with you know, what algorithms could exist that would allow us to design the protocol in the first place? As well as what algorithms exist that would be breaking such a hypothetical protocol. Okay. Okay. So then I think there are also some practical reasons to, um, pragmatic reasons to look at um, generic constructions from, from classes of, of problems. Um, in that, I said that we're not perfect about picking uh, our hardness assumptions. And that, that means that from time to time, things get broken. Uh, either because, um, either because the you know the the function just wasn't a good idea in the first place. There really is an algorithm, asymptotic algorithm, to break the function, or just because we under you know 20 years ago computers were much more were much slower, and we we 
pick the key length too, too long. Okay. Or because we discover that the standard process was influenced by the NSA to weaken our cryptography. Okay. So all of these are reasons why we've had to, we've had to replace one component in a crypto system. And what proving the security based on the generic assumption allows us to do is just replace each component by something that performs the same task without having to redesign the entire crypto system, which is not true if you're, you're thinking about everything in terms of specific functions. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, there's even some efficiency gain by doing um, generic instructions. Okay. Reason, um, by looking at a generic instruction, we can use the, the cheapest version of each component, of each part. Okay. Now there are like some horrible generic constructions like pseudorandom generators from the original paper that did pseudorandom generators from one-way functions. It's been improved since. Um, that just give generic instructions a bad name in terms of efficiency, okay? But because they're handling all these different cases. But actually, most of the literature on generic instructions, you have very simple generic instructions. From a block cipher, we can come up with, you know, uh, different modes of communication. Um, and all you're using is very general properties, and these protocols are really um, are really straight, you know, the protocol itself, maybe not the analysis, tends to be really straightforward. Okay. Um, and so by, uh, when you have this kind of simple generic construction, you can actually shop around for the cheapest ingredient for each part. Oh, that's bad. Okay. So I want to conclude with just, I guess I'm a little early for concluding, but um, I don't want to dwell, dwell on that part. <laughs> it's encrypted, yeah, I, it's obfuscated at the very least. <laughs> okay. um, by just asking uh, a couple more uh, very ill-formed questions. Um, so as I said, we, we progress, as we progress we've made like looking for stronger and stronger cryptographic primitives. So I want to like look ahead and say, where would this quest end? How could this quest end? Okay. Well, one way it could end is if somehow we discover an ultimate cryptographic assumption. A cryptographic assumption, you know, cryptographic kind of cryptographic function so strong that we could do everything we want if it exists. And then you say, oh, now we just want to see whether that thing could actually exist. Um, I don't know what such a thing would look like. So, and it might not, it might not be possible. Okay, yeah, so this is taken from, in, you know, I don't know what in real life it looks like, but in Marvel Comics it's called the Cosmic Cube. <laughs> and it looks like that. <laughs> and it just does everything you want it to do. So, um, so, but then the other possibility is maybe the things we want aren't compatible with each other. So there isn't any ultimate assumption because the things that we could want are, are, um, are inconsistent. So, um, so, so this is like something that we could conceivably uh, prove, you know, formalize and prove. Can we come up with two cryptographic tasks that both seem plausible, but are, are, but we can't have both at the same time? Some kind of technical version of this is like um, the Fiat Shamir heuristic for converting zero knowledge into non-interactive zero knowledge, and zaps are inconsistent. But those are kind of not really, those are kind of tools rather than goals. So I wouldn't, uh, I'm just giving that as kind of a warm up. Um, so I don't think that there's anything 
um, totally convincing along these lines in the literature yet. Thank you. So um, that's pretty much all I have to say, even though I have 15 minutes left. <laughs> but we can get to lunch early. We have uh, plenty of time for questions and even hopefully in the discussion we address some of that. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'll start if um, anybody else does. Yes, yes. Yeah. You think it would. If noted were a mathematician, it would be a problem. Oh, I see. So you're saying like the mathematician, yeah, it's true. The mathematician could be working for the government as part of the cover-up. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> of course, we won't know it if, it, if that's true. I think, I think though, okay, I, I'll, I'll give like an almost serious answer to that, which is that it seems that, you know, if, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the um, hidden mathematical work that's not in the open literature is ahead of the open literature, but I don't know a case where it stays ahead for years and years. So um, maybe maybe that's because I you know, I don't know it <laughs> because it, they're not telling me, um, but um, but I think that if I think it might still be likely that if even if someone in the NSA figures out a factoring algorithm, people in the in the academic world are not going to be more than a few years behind. Yeah, well, so like when I was a student, this really bothered, when I was a grad student, this really bothered me. There were these kind of trendy topics that were clearly sort of overdone and not, you know, exploited to the limit. There was nothing new to say about them, like zero knowledge. <laughs> you know, so in like 86, everything about zero knowledge was totally known. <laughs> How could you keep on publishing papers in Fox and Stock? It was a ridiculous waste of paper. And we, and we actually used paper then for the kids. <laughs> so um, yeah, so politics and fads um, do matter. You know, but I think it's really hard to know which is going to be the fad and which is going to be, uh, which is going to turn out to be the, um, Oh, okay. Yeah. What kind of change is it just because it was a straight up between how cool the application is, maybe previously? Yeah, I think I think and I, but I think that's good. That's what I'm saying. That, that's actually proper. You, you shouldn't put in a you shouldn't ex like a paper that uses a high powered assumption to do something that we already know how to do is not so interesting. But a paper that uses a high powered assumption to do something totally different, um, I think that that's still interesting. Now, you know, what that's saying is that that, that interesting thing is plausible. And I think there's, you know, it's quite likely that some of the recently introduced assumptions are going to be invalidated. But I don't think that, um, 
invalidating particular implementations and particular assumptions is actually going to invalidate this, the historical significance of the work. Even if in the end we conclude that homomorphic encryption is impossible by any means, uh, we had to have some, some ways of visualizing how it could work in order to start thinking about it. Yeah, okay. But, you know, in uh, learning with errors has only been around since, in, since like, 90s. So, you know, how much cryptoanalytic crypto effort has been devoted to that? Not more than a couple decades. We could still break it. Yeah. Hey. So, Yeah. It's very relevant and interesting, but it's done in the context of a specific problem. And there is random self-reducibility, self uh, but it's not something as uh, uh, developed as for languages. How do you see the study of uh, this connection, but based on a specific problem versus general assumption? Um, well, so, uh, oh, you mean like, so, uh, so saying this is like two different uses of random self-reducibility. I mentioned random self-reducibility for discrete log and factoring, but those are or like quadratic residuosity or other things based on factoring, not for factoring per se. Um, those are very limited in that they actually say when you fix the key, then you have random self-reducibility with this, between different problems with the same key. That doesn't actually say there's any, you know, the challenge then is to come up with secure ways of picking the key. And that doesn't give you any insight as to, to that. It gives you, but it does give you um, a number of, as I said, both, um, you know, weaknesses that you could exploit by, um, by naive implementations of, of protocols based on these things. Um, like malleability issues, and um, opportunities to, um, to design more, more, um, more um, powerful primitives like blind signatures from them. Okay, more, more sophisticated in that you're um, doing something beyond what, what you conceived of initially. So that's the sense in which I was using random self-reducibility. In lattices, it's completely different in that you're actually showing a particular distribution on instances, how to generate um, instances that's as secure as the, one, as the worst case. So that's a much deeper notion of random self-reducibility, um, which applies to at least some of the um, cryptographic functions based on lattices, but not to all, you know, not to all of them, as you know. Um, so that's really, um, you know, the interest there is that, um, is that then the negation, you know, if we could do this for, if we could do a similar thing for an arbitrary problem, then the negation of the story about one-way functions becomes even less plausible. It doesn't just say that I can't come up with a way of generating hard solve problems. I can't come up with a way of generating hard problems at all, even without knowing the answer. Um, so that would be, um, uh, if we could do that in a generic setting, that would be fabulous. But you think it I don't. We can always dream, <laughs> but um, I don't see it happening soon. I don't. Know of anyone with a plan? I have a question. You you mentioned that historically um, assumptions, specific assumptions, were broken. Yeah. I, I actually very much agree that we shouldn't have too much faith in specific assumptions. But then I usually lose in arguments because in the early '80s, yes, we have examples like that. But now we've recently had an explosion of all different assumptions, and I can't really think of anything that actually has been broken. Recently, I mean, in okay. Terms of a mathematical assumption, not MD5. 
Yeah, I'm not, okay, so that's why, so like MD, yeah. But th that is kind of a mathematical assumption. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but maybe, so you're, you're right, so um, there are a lot more examples early on, um, and we're not coming up with these now. Um, but maybe it's because, um, uh, we're devoting more time to cryptography than to cryptanalysis um, for the, for at least within these areas. Um, I think it's also people aren't working too hard on cryptanalysis for these, for these things because the protocols that were um, suggested originally are viewed as kind of placeholders and um, and people would rather come up with protocols based on more standard assumptions than work on breaking the assumptions. But uh, that's kind of a sociological thing. I'm not sure if it's even true. So probably people in the audience know whether they're working on breaking the assumptions or not. Yeah. If any. So the other thing in terms of like influence on real life of, of what we do, or like real kind of security, yeah. it seems like we have a lot of success in like cryptomania things. Partially because, you know, if you ask like a random hacker on the street to design a public encryption, a new thing, or a yeah. key, they will just fail mainly because of functionality. On the other hand, in symmetric is the foundational results, like PRG, yeah. some of the functions are amazing, but they have kind of zero impact on real life. Oh. In fact, the standard block ciphers or hash functions, in mode of operation, we had some success, yeah. the basic things, we had like no success. And that seems well, to be kind of... Well, important. okay, I think it's more... Actually, I think I would reverse that. So first, I'm going to actually come back to your question because I just thought of some examples. <laughs> okay. um, well, let me just say it while I'm thinking about it. So just recently, um, elliptical curve cryptography had a big breakthrough in cryptanalysis. Small characteristic fields. And that was something that people actually suggested doing. So um, it still happens. Okay. So. Okay, <laughs> so this may be the problem: is the papers get posted on the on the internet, no one pays attention to them. <laughs> so that's why um, there's not a lot of incentive. Um, but um, I think actually the problem with pseudorandom functions versus pseudorandom generators it, it's actually because um, pseudorandom functions are too easy. Okay. So if you couldn't just hack together a pseudorandom function, okay, um, I said like almost anything's a one-way function, and one-way functions give you pseudorandom functions, and so you can just sort of hack together a pseudorandom function with with some work, then you can then it's probably secure, or you know, it's not non-negligible chance of secure, okay. Um, you can't do that with secure secret key agreement <coughs> because actually. It's actually difficult to find problems for secret key agreement that are uh, that are secure, and so, um, so what this says is that you know the theoretical, the people who like devote a lot of time to protocol design, um, for doing that amount of effort for protocol design, coming up with the very you know mathematically interesting functions is worth it for. Um, for public key cryptography, but not worth it for private key cryptography. So that would be my explanation that we actually, that our, re, our work actually sort of would predict this. Um, so it's not that, yeah. Do you think we can influence practice? Maybe it's, it's a little bit disappointing that essentially anything symmetric key, if you look at what is being used, yeah. is essentially all this family functions to PRG, all this beautiful stuff is kind of irrelevant to that. Well, because they're starting with the pseudorandom function to start with, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I'm getting over my head. <laughs> so I leave that as a, a question to be thought for people to think.